through his presentation and then you know answer some of the questions that were asked last week that he wasn't uh, unable to answer so over to you doc <clears throat> right thank you very much um so uh, i think i've just my video has just gone off um what i'm going to do is you know through his presentation and then uh, there seems to be a little bit of a lag on the system so can can you hear me okay charles yes we can hear you Okay, that's fine. So uh, thank you very much for having me back today um, to share some of my um, um, work in orthopedic surgery with the African and Caribbean community. Uh, what I'm going to do is a similar format to what we had last week. And I know um, uh, last week we, we ran out of time towards the end. Um, I'm going to go briefly again through what I do in terms of um, trauma and orthopedic surgery. Uh, and then I will address those questions that were submitted by people last week who I didn't have time to address and who, who put those questions in through the chat. And then at the end, there'll be some time for questions and answers as well. Um, so I'm going to start, I've got a presentation again, and I'm going to just start sharing my screen now. Okay. So a, a, a little bit of this might be repetitive, but I do apologize for that and bear with me because I'm, I'm aware that possibly not everybody who's um, here today was here last week. So just by means of a brief introduction, um, I am a consultant orthopedic surgeon and I work out of the Manchester region, the northeast part of Manchester. My base hospitals are North Manchester General Hospital and Fairfield Hospital. Those are the two main hospitals I work in. I do some other work at the Royal Oldham Hospital um, and occasionally at Rushden in Infirmary. And I currently act as the clinical director for orthopedic trauma. Um, I I am I'm, I'm, I'm from Nigeria and that's where I did my medical, my primary medical training. And then I came to the UK in the early 90s where I have been since. And I've worked as a consultant in the Northeast part of Manchester for the last 20 years. I've also spent a little bit of time outside the UK as a consultant in orthopedics in the Middle East. And that was very instructive to me in terms of how health systems vary when you move across the world. So I'm going to give a very brief overview. I, I'll, I'll try not to run longer than 15 minutes with this. Uh, to give you an overview of bits of what I do with trauma and orthopedic surgery. And what we do as orthopedic surgeons is look after the, 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 the musculoskeletal system. So that's the bones and joints, muscles and ligaments attached to them. Uh, the parts that move and keep you moving. So it's your arms, your legs, your back and your neck. Uh, and um, people generally come to see a trauma and orthopedic surgeon because they either have pain or they've had an injury to one of these regions. So it's, um, uh, if, you, if you have pain and it has come on over a period of time, you, mo you most likely go through your general practitioner and when the general practitioner wants a specialist opinion, they send it to see an orthopedic surgeon. In the case of an injury, that's usually more acute and you usually come in through the emergency department and if they can do it with it um, in its totality, then an orthopedic surgeon is, is, um, is consulted. I'm gonna spend some time talking about two conditions today. One is osteoarthritis, which is just arthritis is what people tend to refer to that as. That causes pain in the joints and it, it is of slow onset and it comes from a wide period of years and you find yourself getting more pain in a particular joint that's affected with arthritis and there's limitation of movement and limitation of day-to-day -day activity. The other condition which I will touch on because I have been asked once again to talk about this is osteoporosis and this is a painless condition affecting the bones, and it just means your bones get thin and brittle. 
uh, but they do expose you to a higher risk of a fracture, and that's where the problem comes in with osteoporosis. There will be time at the end, I said, as I said, for questions and answers, and I will incorporate some of the questions which I didn't have time to answer last week within this presentation. So in terms of the burden of musculoskeletal problems in the UK, it is actually quite significant. Uh, at any one time, 15 million people in the UK will have problems of a musculoskeletal nature. The vast majority of that being backhand neck problems. So back pain, neck pain, those are very, very, very common. Uh, more than 5 million people have arthritis, which is classed as moderate or severe. And so that has an impact on your day-to-day -day functioning. The vast majority of this is rheumatoid arthritis, sorry, um, osteoarthritis, which is just standard wear and tear, uh, likely a result of aging, occasionally due to previous injury. Uh, there's a small percentage which is due to uh, rheumatoid arthritis and gout and other such inflammatory components, but the vast majority is osteoarthritis wear and tear. About 3 million people have osteoporosis or brittle bones, and that places them at a risk of a fracture. Most of these are postmenopausal women, so women who've gone past the menopause, usually after the age of about 50 or 51. Uh, in terms of how much time we take up of the health service, one in six to one in seven of all GP consultations are for musculoskeletal problems. Uh, once again, commonly back pain, neck pain, hip arthritis, knee arthritis, that kind of a thing. So there's quite a significant burden in the UK. And we believe that a similar burden exists around most of the world, though access is different because um, if you live in, a, in, in an area where there isn't easy or free access, to healthcare, then the presentation might differ. In terms of musculoskeletal pain, if you just spend some time to take a look at this graph, which looks at the effect of any musculoskeletal problems you have on your ability to work. So this refers to UK and it doesn't take into account COVID because I think COVID has changed the employment um, landscape. But for people who have no health conditions at all, about 80% of them are in employment. And that's good for all kinds of reasons, your mental health, your well-being, and your overall health, which is impacted on by your ability to do sports, eat properly, et cetera. So 80% is the baseline. If you have a long-term condition, like diabetes, epilepsy, heart problems, then that figure of employment drops from 80% to about 68%. If you have a musculoskeletal condition, it goes down to 62%. In fact, the only long-term conditions which have a bigger impact than musculoskeletal problems are mental health and learning disability. So the, the burden is quite significant. For those who have musculoskeletal problems and are able to work, it also causes a significant amount of time off work. So about 40% of time off work is for musculoskeletal problems, back pain, neck pain, um, arm and leg problems, and about the same amount due to stress, anxiety, and depression. And the other 20% is made of, of coughs, colds, diarrhea, et cetera. So the, the impact on your ability to work and the, the tendency for you to take time off work is significant, which is why we feel it's important. And if we look at who it affects, I'm sorry I'm bombarding you with graphs. This is the last graph. <clears throat> on the left-hand side of the graph is early years and on the right-hand side of the graph is later years. And for both men and women, we can see that the incidence of musculoskeletal disease rises with age. And over the age of 60, about half, half of the population will have some form of musculoskeletal complaint. So the burden is significant and it increases with age. Why is that relevant to ethnic, um, to black 
African Caribbean people in the UK. If we take a look at how populations are distributed, classically we have a pyramid, a population pyramid, where the youngest um, age group are the majority of the population. And with excess mortality with each 10 year age group, the amount of the number of people uh, get smaller. And when you get to the 80, 85 age group, there are very, very few people indeed. So that's a classical population pyramid. And I've shown what the figures are for Nigeria. If we take a look at the UK, it's different because the UK has an aging population. And there's a significant percentage of the population that is above the age of 65, much more than places like Nigeria. And that means that there's a significant percentage of the population that are going to be having back pain, neck pain, hip pain, knee arthritis. And the burden of that disease is much greater in Western countries because of the, of the age profile. What about Africans and Caribbeans living in the UK? That's interesting because the age profile of the population of Blacks in the UK is different from the general population. It is a hybrid pattern. And so we have, we've had two waves of migration. The earlier wave was from the Caribbeans and the more recent age was from Africa. The average age, median age of Africans in the UK is about 28 to 30. And for people from the Caribbean, it's about 40. So an older age profile. Um, but we still don't see the same number of people above the age of 70 and 80 in the black population as compared to the general population. And I think that's important in the patient population which we see with these various um, health conditions. So I used a lot of case examples last week and I'm going to just go back to one of the case examples which I use of a <clears throat> 62 year old female shop assistant who uh, used to be a keen runner. In the last two years, she hasn't been able to run. And that's because she's had worsening knee pain, especially when she's active. She's able to continue working, but um, she's finding things difficult. And so she gets referred to hospital. Now, she has arthritis, osteoarthritis wear and tear. And that's very common. Um, if you have knee pain and stiffness and you're over the age of 50, then you almost certainly have arthritis. And it's important to get early, um, early, early uh, attention from your general practitioner. And the diagnosis will usually be by an x-ray. And on the left-hand side, we have um, a normal x-ray. And on the right-hand side, there is an x-ray of the patient who has arthritis. And you can probably appreciate that the patient who has arthritis has bone on bone contact on the left hand portion of the x-ray. And that's what makes it so painful. Now, in terms of most arthritis, I will reference arthritis of the knee because that's the joint I treat most commonly, but this applies to most um, joints that have arthritis. The, the treatment options are starting with lifestyle changes. If you're overweight, it would help to lose weight and come back to a normal body mass index if possible. Um, things like regular exercise, ensuring that your muscles remain conditioned, avoiding impact activity, occasionally using a walking stick, modifying your activities, stopping those impact sports, five-a-side football. If you're getting arthritis of the knee, you need to stop those kind of things. Um, and physiotherapy uh, is very important. Physiotherapy can help manage the symptoms for a long time. Medication is largely in the form of pain relief and this should be prescribed by the general practitioner, taking into account any other medical conditions that may exist. When those don't work, there's the uh, option of using injections into the joint, usually a cortisone injection, and then various forms of surgery. Now for, for any type of arthritis, there are 
possibly four or five different operations which we, which we advise. Uh, keyhole surgery is useful for mainly the knee, the elbow, and the ankle. Uh, and this is just a, a model showing what we will do. It's a minor procedure to flush out any debris, any loose bodies in the, in the knee or the elbow or ankle. And that can give significant pain relief, which lasts for 12, 18 months, maybe longer, but it's not a cure. Occasionally, <clears throat> when the joint is so badly affected, some joints can be fused. And the, the reason we do this is that if movement is painful and we can stop the joint from moving permanently, without much detriment, then that is an option to permanently treat the pain from the arthritis. And this x-ray is an x-ray of a foot where the, the big toe has arthritis and is malaligned. And the x-rays on the right with the screws in place show what's happened after the, the, the toe has been straightened and the joint has been eliminated. So there's no longer any movement and no longer any pain. And joint fusion is, 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 is relevant in a, a few of the joints we treat. Occasionally, we choose to realign the joint to improve the way the forces are transmitted across the joint, and that will help any pain and deformity. And this is an example of a patient with a bunion who has had the joint realigned. You notice in this case, the joint in the big toe hasn't been stiffened. We still have the joint. Uh, uh, visible, but the, the alignment has been changed. And we use that occasionally around the knee and around the hip. And when all things fail, we, we, we go for a joint replacement, an artificial joint which replaces um, the surfaces of the, of the joint with metal and plastic. And this is an example of, the, of, of a knee replacement. We also replace the hip, the shoulder, the ankle, elbow, wrist, um, some joints in the toes and fingers, pretty much all joints um, can be replaced. Even the discs in the back and the neck can be, can be replaced. And it's actually quite a successful operation, especially the hip and the knee. Patients are very satisfied with the operation and you get long, um, long lasting good function from these artificial joints. So, <clears throat> These are questions from last week. Uh, there are two people who asked if multivitamins can help wear and tear in the hip. Um, and someone else said they had pain in their left hip, they were limping and they were told they had arthritis and what was the advice? Now, in terms of multivitamins, they, they, they don't actually help wear and tear in the hip. Um, but if you go to the multivitamin section of uh, your local supermarket, there, there, there are things which go along the line of joint, joint care. And there are two compounds, glucosamine, and if you look in your medicine cabinet, you probably have some of them lying around, glucosamine and chondroitin. And in early wear and tear of the hip and the knee, and to some degree the back, there's some evidence that these will slow down the rate of decrease of wear and tear and give you pain relief. They are sold over the counter, so the, the, the side effect profile has to be minimal. Um, and, and so these are things that you can take. If you start to have early arthritis of the knee or the hip, you can take glucosamine and chondroitin. Now for the, uh, for the uh, person who said they had arthritis, all the all the treatment options which I spoke about earlier apply. And so physiotherapy, weight loss, using a walking stick, um, maybe an injection into the hip joint, maybe a hip replacement, depending on the stage of the arthritis um, uh, that you are in. But hip arthritis is, 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 is eminently treatable and the outcome is good with a hip replacement. Importantly, Ethnic minorities in the UK have fewer joint replacements, about a third of what you would expect, taking into account the age distribution. We don't know why this is, and we found this out in the last three years from the data in the joint registry. Um, 
Is it that we're less likely to seek help? Is it that we're less willing to have a major operation that isn't life-saving? We don't know, but that's what the figures say. We're having a, about a third of the hip and knee replacements that um, comparable white population has. I also got a query about a 37 year old who said they had knee pain at the back of the knee going down to the leg and ankle. Um, if you're on the call, I would like to explore this a little bit further. There are two possibilities. If it's pain going from the back of the knee to the leg or the ankle, I'd want to make sure that this isn't a disc problem in the bottom of the back, which is pressing on the nerve and causing a third pain. And um, if there are local features around the knee, which shows the knee has been swollen or restricted in movement, then that's more likely to be a knee problem radiating down the leg. And an MRI scan will be incredibly useful. But we'll be looking at whether we should be getting a scan of your knee or your back, depending on where it seems to be coming from. If you have pain above the knee, it's much more likely to be from the back as well. Pain in the knee usually radiates down towards the foot and very rarely up towards the hip. I also got a question from a 60 year old who fell downstairs and said x-rays are normal and I don't want to accept knee surgery later in life. Will a scan help? Uh, my answer to this is if, if you're 60 and you, you, you had no problems with the knee previously and everything stemmed from a fall, if your x-rays are normal, I'd expect your knee to go back to normal or near, nearly normal within six weeks. If that is the case, you don't need a scan, there are no long-term problems. If, if you're still having problems after six weeks, a scan is essential because the, any other x-rays would just remain normal. And um, a scan will show whether there has been damage to a cartilage or a ligament in the knee, and that can be treated. So don't wait for later in life. If you're still having problems after six weeks from the fall with normal x-rays, you need to be onto your GP. You need to be having a scan, especially if you notice the knee is swelling. We talked about osteoporosis last time, and um, I'm gonna just try and round this off now. We talked about osteoporosis being linked to age. The older you are, the more likely you are, you are to have osteoporosis. Females are the, um, the, the, the big target group. Postmenopausal females much more likely to have osteoporosis. And I mentioned that blacks have higher bone density, so less likely to have osteoporosis. But please don't take this to mean that blacks don't get osteoporosis. Mm -hmm. We do but we start from a higher bone mass and so the tendency is less, but we do get osteoporosis. So somebody asked, well, if I'm not able to take HRT, these are questions from last time, what are the alternatives to hormone replacement? Uh, the, the place of hormone replacement is, is, is actually a little bit funny. It's only a small percentage of people who are prescribed hormone replacement for osteoporosis. And that's because um, osteo uh, hormone replacement does have certain side effects, and I guess that's what you're referring to. So what you'll be offered, first of all, will not be um, hormone replacement. It will likely be something called a bisphosphonate, which can be taken as a tablet or an injection. Um, and the people who are offered hormone replacement usually have other symptoms related to the menopause or had a premature menopause, either because it, that's just what their makeup is or because they had surgery, which took out their ovaries quite early. So if you're unable to take HRT, don't worry about it. See your GP, there are lots and lots of alternatives. Someone asked about the success rate of spinal surgery because they had a herniated disc and they were concerned about the risks and the benefits. Uh, this is all the information I have. So if you have a herniated disc and you have back pain, if you have back pain from a herniated disc, the outcome of back surgery is not very good. And only a minority of spinal surgeons would offer you spinal surgery for back pain with a herniated disc. If you have leg pain, sciatica, so pain going down your leg, the success rate is much better. 
and it's about 80%. At times going as high as 90%, depending on the experience of the surgeon. And so we have these two images of the lumbar spine. On the left is the normal spine. The blue bits are the disc, and the yellow filaments are the nerves that run through the spine. Um, on the right-hand side, there's a herniated disc, which is the reddish part of the disc you can see, and it's pressing on the nerve. And that's what the surgery aims to do, to remove that herniated disc from the, from the nerve. So taking the disc away from the nerve will stop the pressure, which causes the pain going down the leg. It's like hitting your funny bone at the elbow, um, but it doesn't do much for back pain. But if, 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 if there are other issues about this, I'm happy to, to, to take the questions. <clears throat> and the last question, which I couldn't take last time, was somebody asked about a trigger finger. Can it be treated? So the short answer to can it be treated is yes. This is a trigger finger. And what I understand you should be meaning by a trigger finger is that your fingers work normally for most of the time. And all of a sudden you bend your finger and it locks in that position. So that's the ring finger, which is triggering. Locks in that position and you can't get it straight and you try for a while and then it suddenly snaps back and becomes straight. That's a true trigger finger. It's a problem with the tendon. There's a, a bit of a nodule in the tendon which works the finger and occasionally that gets trapped. Uh, and the, 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 the treatment is, is very effective and it's minor. There are the options of a cortisone injection, which is just done as an outpatient procedure, or a very minor operation under local anesthesia to release the trigger finger. So if you do have a trigger finger, um, you, you, you should definitely see your doctor and you can have treatment started. One thing I will say is that we need to make sure it is a true trigger finger, not a dupotrans, where your finger will never straighten um, in a trigger finger, your finger is usually straight and every now and then it goes bent and doesn't straight. But with a contracture, it never straightens and it progressively um, goes more bent. That needs, once again, surgery. There are some injections that can be used. So the take home messages I want to leave you with are that musculoskeletal pain is actually quite common and it is strongly correlated with age. And whilst we know this, we need to understand that the black population in the UK has a different age profile from either the countries we originally originated from or the entire um, population of the UK. There are different health seeking behaviors amongst uh, African and Caribbean uh, members of the, of the population. But, but just be aware that most of your musculoskeletal pain, <clears throat> they are effective options to control uh, and treat the pain. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll stop there and I hope I haven't overrun too much. Thanks, Doc. We're gonna be taking questions now. You can either put your questions in the chat box or you can use the raise hand feature so that I can call you, then you can ask your questions. So any questions? Yeah, uh, Togu. Hope I got your name right. You can unmute and then ask your question. Okay, and then we go to BNC. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, my, my name is Toju. And um, I, I just want to first of all say thanks to the doctor. Very, very insightful presentation. Um, I had, um, I've been having pains in my knees, my, both knees for some years now. And this means that I had to stop um, running. Um, I've tried physiotherapy, um, it didn't work. Now they've, um, they've now started using these injections that they, 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 they inject into my knees. Um, and it, 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 it helps for some time, but after a while, it sort of goes back to, you know, I still feel the same pains. Um, I'm just wondering if there's a, what, what, what can be the next step or next line of treatment? 
because physiotherapy didn't work. The injection that injected my knee worked for some time, for some months, and then afterwards, you know, the pain will come back. Um, I'm, I'm just thinking what should be the next line of um, intervention. Thank you. Okay, just just one quick question for you. Just your age range. Um, what 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 age are we are, are we dealing with? I will be fourteen. I'll be forty nine in a few weeks. Okay. So um, yeah, that's very that's um, a very important question. It, it's a common clinical problem I face, and that is patients with painful knees who. Um, um, and I, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption, I'm making an assumption that this, this is osteoarthritis, this is slightly earlier onset osteoarthritis. There are a number of reasons people could have earlier onset osteoarthritis. One might just be genetic, a small number of people. Two could be due to either a single major injury at some stage, which if it's affecting both knees seems unlikely, or due to um, habitual, repetitive minor injuries. So running, football, that kind of a thing. If you've done that a lot, then unfortunately over time, you do tend to end up with wear and tear arthritis. The fact that you're having injections seems to be, uh, seems to, uh, conf to confirm that diagnosis. Now at 49, I would be quite unwilling to do any major operations which involve metal and plastic and replacement. And I'd usually want people to be above the age of 60, 65, and most likely not working. That's the ideal situation. But we do them as young as 30, if necessary. My youngest patient has been 33. So you've had physiotherapy, so you've gone through the right things. I don't know if you're taking painkillers a lot of people say, I don't want to be reliant on painkillers. Um, but with arthritis, it's, it's, it's a long-term condition similar to high blood pressure or diabetes. And at times you have to, they all have side effects. Coming to the injections, injections don't cure arthritis, they're in control. And you seem to be responding to the injections, but they have a short, um, they have a short uh, duration of action. You're likely having cortisone injections, steroid injections, and what they do is they uh, temporarily stop the inflammation within the knee and the pain. But also, they do have one important side effect you should be aware of, and we're getting more data about this in the last two or three years, that regular steroid injections can Increase, they, they, they can accelerate the rate at which arthritis progresses. Uh, the reason is that every injection will cause a very temporary softening of the surfaces of the joint. And if you have that done repeatedly, then there's just that period when it's excessively soft that you can have a bit more wear and tear happening. Uh, if you're, there, there, there are some other injections that are available. Um, they're called uh, hyaluronic acid injections. They are probably as effective as steroid injections, but they don't have that side effect. Unfortunately, NICE withdrew the funding for these injections about 10 years ago. And so most CCGs and most GPs, most hospitals are not able to administer these injections on the NHS. Um, NICE withdrew the recommendation based on costs rather than effectiveness. Um, and in a, you know, in a publicly funded health service, you've got to make some choices. So for, for, for people like you, I think the most important thing is A, continue with physiotherapy to keep your muscles in good shape and to ensure that you don't lose range of movement in the knee. The second is to avoid impact activity. So you may enjoy running and the steroid injections may allow you to run or play football, but, but don't because once you started having wear and tear in the knees, that only accelerates with more impact activity. Um, if you're really struggling, uh, struggling, you should have an MRI scan to see if there's anything that can be done with a keyhole operation. Um, you'd need it done on both sides and have a discussion with the surgeon whether you know, that has a place. And if possible, if you can seek hyaluronic, high, hyaluronic acid injections rather than steroid injections. So that would be my advice at this stage. 
Um, if you if you have any comments on that, I'm happy to hear you, Toju. Thank you very much. I I, I think it's the I think I'm currently on the hyaluronic um, injections. That's fantastic. Where do you live? That's the one I'm currently on. That's fantastic because 90% of GPs and hospitals in the UK do not have access to hyaluronic acid injections on basis of cost. So wherever you are, stay there. It's, it's very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Vinci. Hi, thank you uh, for my opportunity. Uh, my question is, uh, if uh, someone comes to the hospital after a fall, and uh, we consider them as, as uh, you know, their bonds are osteopenic or osteoporotic, how soon we start them on bisphosphonates? It, um, it depends on what's happened after the fall. Has the person had a fracture or they yes. haven't had a fracture? Yeah, yeah, yeah. After the fracture, sorry, that's what I meant. After the fracture, yes. Um, there's some controversy as to when you should start bisphosphonates. Most people now wait a while, um, usually about six or eight weeks, within three months. Six now, if you Yeah. Six so the reason to wait is to, is to ensure that they have normal levels of calcium and vitamin D. And that's usually something you start immediately because the bisphosphonates for, to, to some degree require that to be, uh, you don't want to give it to somebody who's vitamin D deficient or who's, um, who, who doesn't have um, adequate calcium stores. So, so calcium and vitamin D is started immediately. Yeah. Bisphosphonates take time to work and there's no huge rush to start bisphosphonates. Um, but they should be started. Depending on the age, you probably need a DEXA scan first to ensure that you do have osteoporosis. There are some age groups where you can make the diagnosis and say, well, that is osteoporosis. Um, but so, so if, if you're pretty certain it's osteoporosis and you don't need a DEX, DEXA scan or you have had a DEXA scan before, then the first step is to start with the, with the immediate bone health on calcium and vitamin D and with the aim of starting bisphosphonates within about six weeks to three months. But that delay really doesn't matter. Bone is a very slow remodeling tissue and it takes a long time for bisphosphonates to act. Uh, uh, thank you. And, you know, someone who had a fall uh, and fracture with the bisphosphonates, yeah. if we are changing the medication, upgrading the medications to strontium granulate or anything, do yeah. we need to refer them to osteoporotic clinic? Or yeah, so, yeah, bisphosphonates are the first line treatment. And when you're moving on to other things like strontium granulate or any other second line type of treatment, that usually needs specific specialist input. Okay. So the questions that will be asked is, why does this patient have osteoporosis? Why is this patient having a second fracture despite being on bisphosphonates? And that will trigger the need for a second bone density scan. Okay. If the second bone density scan shows that the bisphosphonates are working, then you need to look at why the patient is continually having falls. So if your bone density is increasing as expected, there's no need to change. If your bone density isn't increasing, you have to ask why are the bisphosphonates not working? Are mm -hmm. they being taken? They're very funny. You've got to take them standing up and with a glass of water, etc. Is the patient able to comply? Are they taking it with, let's say, milk, which just then activates it and makes it unavailable? In which case, you might be changed to an injectable form. If, all, if despite all this, it's just the fact that bisphosphonates are not working and a DEXA scan proves that, then you move to second line treatment like, um, like strontium ranulate. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, Doc. There's a question here about if you can recommend any herbal, you know, <laughs> remedies for, you know, the bones. Um, Herbal remedies for the bones. Uh, there, are no, there are no real herbal remedies for, for bones. I mean, that's not something which I, um, 
uh, you know, by practicing West, Western medicine. I'm sure that there are things that are recommended, but they are not things which we would um, recommend. They are, they are non-pharmacological methods, which would, you know, like the exercise, making sure that you get enough vitamin D in your diet. You won't get enough, so you'll need supplements anyway. Making sure you spend enough time outdoors so you can get enough vitamin D. Making sure you eat foods that are rich in calcium. And also looking at your recommended activity levels of, you know, half an hour a day of vigorous activity. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question. The reason is that there's, the, the, so those are general bone health measures, but there are so many different things. Like if you're, if you're, let's say, looking to avoid osteoporosis, or if you've got arthritis, I can see there's a question on frozen shoulder. If you've got injuries or fractures, there are so many different things, but, um, I think overall a good balanced diet and um, a, uh, sticking to the recommended levels of activity as a minimum, which we as a community actually seem to do quite well at in terms of activity. Thanks doc. And there's one about advice on frozen shoulder. I've had this for almost a year now, had physio, but it didn't work. I've been given two options, operation or hydrodilation. And this was cancelled due to COVID. The pain is still there and, you know, but not as severe as it used to be. I'm 52. Can you advise, please? Yeah, so if you've got a frozen shoulder, <clears throat> the first thing I'd want to um, ensure is that the diagnosis is correct and it's actually a frozen shoulder, not arthritis or impingement or some of the other things which cause pain around the shoulder. But if you've been offered hydrodilation or surgery, I can assume you've seen a shoulder surgeon and I can assume the diagnosis is correct. So um, I don't know if you probably can't see me, but if you, if you put your hands in front of you like that, um, so uh, elbows to the side and your, and your hands at 90 degrees and you take them out, you should be able to get them about 45 degrees and more importantly, it should be symmetrical. With frozen shoulder, you'll find that you can't move that arm out anywhere near as far as you can move the other one. I'm so in that case, the diagnosis will be correct for being frozen shoulder. Um, unless it's bilateral, on, on, unless it affects both shoulders, which is quite uncommon. The one patient group we know have problems with frozen shoulder that is often resistant is is diabetics. If you're not diabetic, then <clears throat> if you've tried physiotherapy and it's, and it's been going on for about 18 months, then I think um, hydro distension is probably preferable at this stage to surgery. And I presume surgery will usually be just an anesthetic and manipulation of the shoulder. And that's quite effective to manipulate the shoulder, get your range of movement back and then continue with physiotherapy afterwards. Um, COVID has disrupted a lot of things and treatment of frozen shoulder, both with physiotherapy because it involves face-to-face hands-on treatment. Although some hospitals have gone on to video conferencing and, um, and um, web-based exercises. So if you've had it for about a year and you still have pain and limitation of movement, then the next stage you're right would be I think hydrodistension is, is certainly less invasive, can be done as an outpatient procedure. Um, and does the, it has very few <clears throat> possible complications. Uh, the only one which really concerns us is infection. And that's what I would opt for first. If your surgeon has assessed the degree of stiffness in the shoulder and feels that a manipulation is required at this stage, or maybe some keyhole debridement, and that's, advised early for some people, like I said, notably diabetics who tend to have a much more severe form of frozen shoulder. So that should be my advice at this stage. I, I don't know if you're on the call and you have any more information or anything else you want to say. So any, any follow-on question? Uh right, okay, Doc, uh, there's another one. My wife feels numbness in the fingers and you know inside the left hand sometimes both hands could you i mean what could be the cause so it it, it depends on where the it depends on where the numbness is 
Um, the, the common causes of numbness in the hands is nerve compression. And nerve compression can occur in a number of places. Common places will be around the wrist, like carpal tunnel syndrome. And we can also get nerve compression at the elbow. So every now and then you may strike your elbow in a funny way, you get that, um, what do you call it? You, you hit your funny bone and you get tingling in your little finger, very momentary, but that's because you've just hit the nerve. Uh, if you have nerve compression at the elbow, you, you, you may notice that if you have your hands up for a long time, come on with smartphone use, you start to get some numbness in your little finger and maybe your ring finger. And that is eased by straightening your elbows out. You could also have nerve compression at the level of the neck because that's where the nerves from the, uh, from, the, uh, from the spinal cord exit to give you sensation in the hands. Those are the three possible, the three common areas where you can get nerve compression in. If it is affecting, um, if it's affecting all the fingers equally, um, you need to be, you need to look for things that can affect all the nerves in the body. And the, the, the commonest thing in the black community is diabetes. So make sure that you've been screened for diabetes. Diabetics do get problems with the very small vessels that supply the nerves. And um, so you can get something called a diabetic neuropathy. Uh, but if you, if, you, if you pop down to the GP, uh, they'll be able to give you some advice. Nerve compression problems often seem to be much more symptomatic at night when you're sleeping because you don't have the conscious control of your hands and you know you could sleep with your hands in funny positions. So if you're using a smartphone and your fingers get numb, you just straighten them out. But at night you may spend long periods of time and then wake up with one or both hands feeling numb. Thanks doc. There's a question about, you know, apart from plantain, what other food contains calcium? Um, so most of the calcium that we eat ends up, well over 90% of the calcium we eat ends up in our bones. And if you can imagine calcium is a bit like white chalk and we've all seen what bones look like. And so, um, anything that contains bones where you do eat the bones and I'm very, I'm very careful when I say this because um, in Nigeria where I come from um, eating you know bits of the softer parts of chicken bones is, 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 is a common is a common thing we do it's not something that Caucasians uh, certainly um, the indigenous white population in the UK don't do that but that's a very high source of calcium. In terms of more conventional sources of calcium, um, fish where the bones are eaten. So fish where you have soft bones and they, 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 they're not going to lodge in your throat, like um, you know, some of the sardines and tuna and things like that uh, are high in calcium because you're consuming the skeleton. In terms of non-animal sources of calcium, it's usually the dark green leafy vegetables um, that, that, that are high in calcium. And those are, those are quite good uh, as, 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 as a general part of your bone health. Getting adequate calcium is essential, essential in your first 20, 25 years in life because that's when you're building your bones up. And after about the age of 30, building bone mass is, is, is very difficult. You really just lose it as a, at a small amount every year. And so having an adequate intake of calcium for youngsters, teenagers is, is key. Um, and also there's this second thing, which is the detrimental effect of carbonated drinks on your bone density. So uh, if you have children who are in their you know, uh, early teens, late teens, etc. Try and minimize the amount of carbonated drinks in addition to maximizing calcium intake. Thanks, Doc. There is another question that has come. If you could throw more light on trigger figure and finger and, and whether there's a treatment for it. 
Okay. So I I try to I'll I'll just try and do this if I can. It might, it might demonstrate it better. So that's my hand normally, and it should normally do that all the time. And with a trigger finger, what I'll find is that every now and then I'll do that and I find I can't straighten this finger. And it just happens every now and then with no real reason. And then I manipulate it and something happens and all of a sudden it flicks back. So that's a trigger finger and, and, and that's the triggering we refer to. Uh, it, it, it's unpredictable. Some patients will demonstrate the triggering to you. They say, listen, if I do this, look, I can't straighten it out anymore and then, and then I can get it back out. And what's happening is that the, the tendon that moves the finger is, is, is like a bit of rope. Um, and on the front of the finger, it runs through a series of tunnels. So the rope is running through some tunnels and the rope should be quite smooth. <laughs> Every now and then, for some reason, the rope, the tendon gets a nodule within it. So it goes like that and then you have a bit of a, um, you know, horseshoe shape in it. That thickening in the tendon, when you bend your finger, it gets trapped on one edge of the one edge of the tunnel and you can't get it back easily and then you've got to yank it through. So there are two treatments. One is to open that tunnel, which I said is the minor operation under local anesthesia and allows that swollen tendon to now move up and down freely. Or you can have an injection around the tendon which will cause the tendon to shrink and allow it to pass through the 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 tunnel a little bit more easily. Uh, so that's trigger finger. And like I said, trigger finger, normal movement most of the time. If you have a situation where your fingers are slowly bending in over a period of years, and you end up with your fingers in that way and you can't straighten them out and you've got a band here, that's a different thing, uh, but it's still amenable to surgery. Uh, but with trigger finger, Moving normally most of the time, every now and then the finger gets stuck and then snaps back. Thanks, Doc. There's a question here, a few more on fingers. What causes the fingers to go stiff and painful while staring during cooking? This goes after a few minutes, though. But what causes that? During cooking? So that's, that's difficult, really. I mean, it, it could be... It depends on the age. Um, if, if you're having pain and stiffness on activity, then that's most likely related to early, uh, well, not early, but the earlier stages of wear and tear arthritis. Um, if you take a look at your fingers and around the joints, normally there shouldn't be any major swelling around the joints. But if you, if you put your hand up like that and you can find that you've got bony protrusions where the fingers bend, where the joints are, usually at the last joint, that's a hallmark of the start of arthritis. And if arthritis is starting, what happens is that when you're doing activity with a particular joint, you get pain and stiffness, which is initially short-lived and then later on can be longer-lived. If you find that it is the entire finger, which is maybe getting swollen and you're under the age of 50, that's more indicative of a possible inflammatory type arthritis, rheumatoid type arthritis. And that can be treated with specific anti-inflammatory medication. Um, and and, and if, it, if it is inflammatory arthritis, it is important that that is addressed at a very early stage because they can rapidly destroy joints. Um, very occasionally you do get some of the much more benign conditions which just come with overuse and the problem with the blood supply to the, uh, to the fingers. If, if you have an extra of the hands and the joints are okay, um, then that's much less of a problem. But it will be worth ensuring that it isn't something that is going to have any long-term effect on the joints and perhaps shouldn't be addressed at this stage. Thanks, Doc. There's another one about, you know, how could you prevent or control sudden muscle tightness, commonly called muscle pull, over the night on the leg? Oh, night cramps. Um, yeah, night cramps are 
mud cramps are a problem. They are difficult to treat. They usually basically a result of the uncontrolled muscle contraction, which happens without your being able to do anything about it. It's important to ensure that there, there, there isn't any underlying abnormality. So some routine blood tests would be essential to make sure that your electrolytes are normal, your calcium levels are normal. And all that being normal, the, the, the common medication that is prescribed by, by GPs is, is quinine. Um, quinine is not an over-the-counter medication. Uh, so your doctor will speak to you and ensure that the, the, the most important problem with quinine is it, it can have some side effects related to the heart. So they, they'd want to know about your blood pressure and take an ECG before placing you on quinine. There isn't a lot you can do to on your own control night cramps. Um, so it does need medical attention, some routine blood tests to ensure your electrolytes are normal, and then your GP will consider placing you on quinine. Thanks, Doc. There, there is another question. And, and I know last week you offered some private consultation. So, yeah, yeah. you know, there is some take up. So if there's anything anyone wants to follow up with, you know, Doc about, please put your details in the chat box. You can send that privately. I think we have another question in the chat box. And it's about back pain, you know, and the left hips. So I'm wondering if you can pick that, Doc. Uh, sorry, just can you uh, read it out to me? What does it so say? Kind of back pain, back due, pain to... due to spondylolisthesis deteriorate due to having left hip and left elbow pains. Deteriorate to having left hip and left elbow pains. Yeah. So um, spondylolisthesis is. Let me see that. So uh, I've got an, uh, a kind of model of the lower back here. So this is the very bottom end of the back, just over the the buttocks in this region. And these are the, the, the movable parts of the spine. They're usually quite well aligned. In spondylolisthesis, what happens is that usually at the, it's usually at L4 and L5, between L4 and L5 or L5 and S1, one of these vertebrae slips forwards or well, that's spondylolisthesis or backwards. Um, uh, due to a combination of things, degeneration, stretching of the ligaments, and it does cause pain in the lower back. It can cause pain radiating to the hip because the, 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 the nerves that serve the hip do run around that area. So you can get left hip pain. It will not cause problems with the elbow. So that would be a separate problem if you're having, if you're having pain in the elbow. I'll just take a look at the question again, which says, can it deteriorate to having left hip pain? Yes, it can deteriorate to having left hip pain. That is, it can cause pain in the left hip. Left elbow pains, no, it can't. What I can't work out is whether you're asking if it can deteriorate because you're having left elbow pain. And once again, the elbow won't have a connection to the spondylolisthesis. It's a very localized problem at the bottom of the lower back, and it will cause back pain and can cause pain radiating down one or both legs, the hip, the knee, maybe even down as far as the ankle. Um, there is treatment available for spondylolisthesis. Most commonly is rehabilitation and physiotherapy and back exercises, but there's a place for surgery and nerve decompression. If you're having nerves um, being compressed and causing pain down the lower limbs, Thanks, Doc. There's a question from Mary. Mary, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Hello, sorry. Um, I missed uh, the beginning, so I'm not sure if anybody has asked about sciatica. Um, I seem to um, only it get worse when I'm pregnant. Um, also, when I climb up um, more than one flight of stairs, um, the, but the pain is only on the right-hand side. I'm just wondering why when a baby can lie on any side but it seems to only hurt on the right hand side and is there anything i can do um to help because obviously not being able to go up upstairs uh, constantly is not healthy because i have to keep using the the lift and stuff so i'm just wondering what's causing what's causing it please 
So uh, if you just stay on the line, sciatica just to be clear is pain which starts from the region of the lower back and goes down into the leg and goes below the knee. Is that, is that what you're talking about? Yes, that's correct, yes. Right, okay, yeah. So the, the, the reason you get um, sciatica is the pain, the source of the pain originates in the back. And I'll just go to this um, model again. So that's the back. And the, the source of the pain originates in the back and it's usually from either one of the discs here, yeah, or maybe one of the many joints, which is maybe slightly out of alignment or the ligaments are a little bit weak. And you've got nerves that come out through those holes there. And so if anything touches on that nerve, it gets very painful and causes pain right where the nerve runs. The frustrating thing about sciatica is that where you feel the pain, that is in your leg. It's not the source of the pain. And so if my shoulder is painful, I tend to, you know, rub it because that's where the pain is and you can get some relief. But to try and get relief from sciatica pain is difficult because it's the pain is referred from a problem elsewhere. Why do you get it only on one side when pregnant? It's not the baby causing pressure. It's just the general changes in your body. And so when you're pregnant, um, there are hormones that get secreted, which cause your ligaments to become a little bit laxer. Ligament, a hormone called relaxin. And that can also affect the ligaments in the spine. And so depending on where the vulnerability lies, in this case, the right-hand side, you get maybe some more laxity and you would get pressure on the nerve on the right-hand side and it will cause pain going down the, down the right leg. In terms of treatment, the, what we know about sciatica is that nine out of 10 people actually, it goes within about six months. In your case, if you say it has happened in pregnancies and if it has lasted outside pregnancy, then you clearly fall outside that group. And the first thing is to find out what is pressing on the nerve and at what level and that needs an MRI scan. And it's usually a disc or a bit of bony protrusion from the joints in the, in the spine we talked about. Um, the options are, first of all, you must have physiotherapy anyway because your back muscles will be acting in a slightly abnormal way to protect what they feel is a vulnerability. So that is key in addition to whatever else happens. If physiotherapy doesn't sort it out, keep up with the back exercises. Injections into that area can help. Um, they can shrink any swollen nerves that have been trapped in a tunnel and take the pressure away and allow you more freedom to then rehabilitate your back. If there's a single area where you have nerve root entrapment on a scan and the measures which I've talked about haven't helped, then your surgeon will talk to you about the option of a decompression operation, which is designed to take any disc or wear and tear bits of bone away from around the nerve where it's being compressed. But, but important, it, it isn't actually the baby, it's the effects, the general effects of pregnancy that cause the sciatica. Thank you very much, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Doc. And I think one more question here. Is it true that strength training can help with osteoporosis and, you know, or, or joint pains? Yes, on both counts. Um, strength training definitely helps with osteoporosis, definitely helps with osteoporosis. So the basic thing that you should do will be weight bearing activity because that loads your skeleton and promotes a response and, you know, either makes your bones denser if you're in the phase where you're growing your skeleton or continues to give your skeleton a little bit of um, a stimulus uh, so you don't lose bone. And, and so that's the baseline, weight bearing, physical activity, walking, running, playing football. Uh, but then if you go to strength training, you're putting your bones and joints under a significant amount of stress and they respond accordingly. So your muscles get bigger, your ligaments and tendons get tougher over time and um, your bones also increase in, in density. 
it's a slow process and you have to take it um, gradually and make any increases very, very gradual. Your muscles respond quickest, your tendons a little bit slow and your bones are very, very slow to respond. Um, and um, sorry, the other thing, there was osteoporosis and there was another question. Joint pain. Joint pain, yes. So um, they don't on their own um, stop joint pain. But if you're starting to get joint pain, it points to possible arthritic changes. What happens with arthritis if your, let's say your shoulder is painful or your elbow is painful, your knee or whatever, your body will um, automatically start to protect that part of the body and will tell you your right knee is painful. So when you're standing, you put more weight on your left side. Over time, the muscles will very slowly start to suffer, shrink a little bit, and you lose range of movement. You can arrest those by doing exercises to ensure that the muscle is maintained around the areas where you have the joint pain and you don't lose the, the range of motion. And that's what physiotherapy usually tends to, uh, to address when you have, uh, when you have joint pains. Uh, so on both counts, strength training is good. You shouldn't be doing strength training which worsen your joint pain. So there are safe exercises to do for whichever joints you're trying to you're trying to work on. Okay, I know we we out of time, but there are one or two more questions, and yes, also nice. I've been prompted, Doc, that if you could come back another time and do something about the feet, because I think we focus a lot on the hands and fingers. So there was someone who asked a question about numbness, but I think when you explain it, you know, the person was offline, had lost okay. connection. And also a question about if you experience pain in your, you know, joints and in your legs, you know, how do you treat that? And then there's a final one about whether it's recommended to have knee surgery for arthritis, even if you have not been on medication as Thank it's so disfiguring the shape of my knees. Um, so I'll take the last question first. Yeah, so so is, is it recommended to have knee surgery when you haven't been on medicines um, uh, as is disfiguring the shape of my knees? Okay, you have knee surgery for arthritis. Well, if you have arthritis and your knees are a problem, then you should be on medication. The side effect profile of medication is, is, is so much safer than having an operation. And nine out of 10 people with arthritis in the knees can control their symptoms with medicines. If a patient comes to me and says, my knees hurt, I say, what are you taking for pain? And if they say, I'm taking nothing, I say, well, you need to take something. And when they don't work, we'll consider an operation because that's the place of an operation when the medicines stop working. The shape of the knees, medicines won't change the shape of the knees. Um, arthritis, if, you, if you're having a knee replacement, for instance, it will straighten out your knee after the uh, knee replacement. So I can see the attraction to think about it in that way. But uh, to have surgery for arthritis just because the knee um, is, is going out of shape will probably not be the right thing. There are some types of arthritis that progress quicker than others. So if your knees are, if you're going knock kneed with arthritis, that progresses very quickly. And you may well see a surgeon who looks at the x-rays and says, don't bother with painkillers. We need to just go and do this because in a year's time, it's gonna be so much worse. And I would agree with that. If you're getting bow-legged, the progression is much slower. And if you're getting slightly bow-legged, I would usually ask you, please try and take some tablets. If, you, if, you, if you're having side effects or if, um, if, 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 the, if the tablets are not working, then come back and we'll discuss a knee replacement operation. But with no medication, I'd be hesitant to offer surgery purely because you're um, getting either bow-legged or not need. Uh, so uh, the second question, does that answer all the points that the that that's raised, or are there any issues? I'm 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 happy to stay on. Don't worry. Okay. Uh, well, 
Okay. So... Bit, yeah, yeah, I think that's that. And then the, the, there was one about numbness. Numbness. Just remind me what it was about the numbness. Right. I need to go back to... Uh, was it my the wife, wife feels... has numbness yeah. and the numbness and, in, and, and itches inside yeah. the left hand, sometimes both hands? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so I said the, 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 the common cause of numbness in the hands would be... Uh, a localized compression of the nerves, commonly at the wrist, which is carpal tunnel, at the elbow or at the neck. And there are tests which will differentiate which is which and depending on which fingers are affected. The other thing is that it could be something affecting the entire nerves rather than just compression in one part of the body. And the, 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 the commonest condition is diabetes, um, where you can get a diabetic neuropathy affecting the nerves. And so it's important to get screened for diabetes and also to you know, speak to your doctor about, if it's at the elbow, usually the little and ring fingers are affected. If it's at the wrist, it's usually the thumb, the index and the middle finger, which gets which get affected by numbness. And it's usually worse at night um, when you might wake up and suddenly find you can't feel your, your hand. And there was, a, there, there was a last question, which I have forgotten. Yeah, it was about uh, pains in the joints and the legs. Ah, well, that's, a, <laughs> that's a difficult one because there are so many joints in the legs, uh, hip, knee, ankle, and toes. So um, if the color is on, can I just, if you can just unmute yourself and give me a little bit more information as to where the pain is. Can you unmute and ask? If not, I'll, I will pass your details on, Doc. Okay. Uh, yeah. So just to say that from last week, I did say that I was happy to, um, to, to, there's some people I felt specifically, A, I needed more information, and B, I was almost certain that something could be done to, uh, to improve their medical condition if they got the right advice. Um, there has been a little bit of a delay in collating that information and sending it to me, but now I do have the information and I will start to, ring the people who have um, made their, who have uh, uh, consented to being contacted. Um, so it's, it's, it's just a brief phone call to get a little bit more information and I'll pinpoint you in the right direction. Thanks doc. Finally, before you go, I think it's, what if you're having severe pains in your knees, which isn't arthritis and also difficulty walking and general weak knees? Yeah, so yeah, there, there are a whole host of reasons which vary according to the age. And so we see a different pattern in people who perhaps are in their maybe mid-20s, early 30s, to those who are in their 60s and, and 70s. Now, the, the first thing will be to have the knees properly assessed. And don't forget the legs are driven by the bottom of the back. And so what I'd be wanting to do first of all is, um, is there a problem in the lower back? Is there some nerve compression, especially if you're talking about weakness? Um, if you're about the age of 60, is there spinal arthritis, which is narrowing the spinal canal uh, and, and, and starting to crowd on the, on the nerves in there, a condition called spinal stenosis. A number of patients are sent to my clinic for a knee replacement and I find they have hip arthritis. So hip arthritis can cause knee pain um, and a lot, of, um, a lot of GPs, they don't have that much time in the surgery and it's easy to overlook that when you complain of knee pain and the problem is in the hip. Or it could be a primary neuromuscular problem. So a problem with the nerve and muscle control of the knees if the main problem is, is, is weakness. Uh, but I'd be looking to investigate that patient a little bit, um, just, just in a little bit more depth. An X-ray of the knees will tell me 100% of the time whether there's arthritis. And if the X-ray is normal, then there's no arthritis. I'd then be looking at the bottom of the back. Examination will tell me if I should be looking at the hip. And if I can detect weakness, um, difficulty maintaining your legs straight, problems with resisted movements, 
Then I'd either be looking at an MRI scan of the back or some nerve conduction test, depending on what I find. So um, once again, if you want to speak to me to get some more information across, I'm, I'm happy if you, if you let Charles have your details. Thanks, Doc. And the final one has come in before we wrap up. I'm having very painful hip and I can't work. The pain is radiating to my groin, swelling, you know, in, uh, swelling in the ankle as well. What do you advise? Uh, if, if the color is on the line, just the age, if the color is not on the line, I'll uh, uh, if, if, if they can unmute, if they, if, if they can't, I'll... Just age will be very helpful. Yeah. Hello, it's me here. Margaret. Hello. Um, I got this hip pain for over five months now, and it's radiating from my thighs to the groins. Okay. Now I've noticed that my legs, the ankles are swollen, though I have got underlying problems like yeah. the type 2 diabetes, hypertension, the, the pains on my uh, sacrum down. If I'm walking, I can't walk. Sometimes if I get up early in the morning, it takes me ages to sit up. The twinkling finger is also there. So just name me Catrat. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, I'm, afraid, how, I'm afraid to even go to the hospital. Well, so, um, I, I think maybe in the current situation with COVID, but otherwise don't be afraid to go to a hospital. How, how old are you? I'm 65. 65. So um, with groin pain at 65, top of the list should be arthritis of the hip. And an x-ray will say, 100% of the time, whether it is hip arthritis or not. And that's a very simple intervention. Yeah, um, they went for a scan uh, in which is sure they say it's arthritis of the hip, but mm -hmm. they're not giving me anything and it is painful, I can't sleep in the night. Okay. So w w when you start to get arthritis of the hip and the knee, which interrupts your day-to-day -day activity, disrupts your sleep, and yes. limits your walking distance. That's the threshold for hospital assessment. And you should now be under a consultant rather than the general practitioner. If it is hip arthritis causing that degree of um, dysfunction. If it is hip arthritis, believe me, that's very good news because a hip replacement will, 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 will solve your problems. If it's hip arthritis causing all those symptoms and you'll be incredibly happy with the outcome. No operation is risk-free, no operation is risk-free, but hip replacements have an incredibly good track record for treating hip arthritis. So can I book appointment to see you? Because I don't even have confidence in everything that is going on now. <laughs> um, so because of the way the National Health Service works, all the patients belong to their general practitioner. And so, um, it, we can't actually see any patient who hasn't been referred by the general practitioner. Uh, so you should approach your GP for a referral to hospital. Has that been offered, referral to hospital? Or? Yes, I've done um, physio for almost one year. They put me to give me that triggering injection at the hand. The nurses said because of the medication, later on the consultant said that's nothing to do with the the, the the finger after two years it, it it corrected itself. It was normal about two weeks ago. The three green finger came back mm -hmm. together with the arthritis. Then the back one, I used uh, this aboniki Nigeria work to rub the back to produce the heat to relieve me for some time, but yeah. it come back later. Yeah. So then when the doc, I also, they say I have an injury to my shoulder. I continue going until one day they say, well, it is for injection, then I refuse. So they discharge okay. me off. Ma Ma Margaret. It, Margaret, it, what it, I'm going to ask is that if you can give your details to Charles, if you don't mind, I will speak to you because I think I'm... And I, I probably need to speak to you in a little bit more detail than I can do in a, in a very quick... Um... Would that yes. be okay, Charles? Yes, yes, yes. 
and, and and also a reminder for you know i mean i'm one of the governors at manchester foundation trust but also we have links with all the hospitals in greater manchester so if if any member of our community is having challenges we're more than happy to provide that advocacy support and we have lots of doctors including you know doc asumu who will give us advice and and help us so that you know, like Doc is saying, you, you might have a local GP and sometimes it's about how you articulate the issue. So what we do is to get some, you know, insight from the professionals and to help you to be able to request, you know, the appropriate care. So Margaret, if you put your details in the chat box, I will pass that on to Doc and then we will help you, you know, to get the right treatment. So th thanks everyone for, for your time. I mean, Doc has talked a lot about exercising. On Tuesdays, we have a physical activity and nutri nutrition session between 6.30 and 7.30 p.m. And, and, you know, the health hour is every Saturday morning. The login details are still the same. You know, we will confirm the topic for next week. It might be mental health. It might be something else. But we'll confirm that in the course of the week. You can follow us on Facebook. You can, you know, join us, you know, on YouTube as well. But Doc, any final words before I hand over to Dorothy Evans, who is one of Khan's directors, to say thanks? No, I thank you very much for giving me this um, this platform and the opportunity to engage with the members of the Black community. Um, it's just to say that the NHS is a fantastic service with huge, huge resources. And you just have to interface with it properly to get everything you need from it. Um, all these treatments are available, all the data we have still tell us that um, we possibly don't access services to the same degree as, um, as, as, as the indigenous Caucasian population. And I think things like this, which you're, which, which you're doing through CAN, will help us get the, you know, the best for our own health. Thanks a lot, Doc. On the 6th of August, we would have a session on prostate cancer in the evening. And also, we have a consultation next Tuesday. But I'll hand over to Dorothy now to, to say thanks. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's been great to see you all to here today. Uh, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to everybody who's been able to join us. The session has gone on for quite some time, which demonstrates the level of interest. And a massive thank you on your behalf to Dr. Asumu for taking the time to answer all of our questions in such great detail and also for um, supporting us as individuals in our private sessions. We look forward to seeing you all, hopefully um, at our next events, as Charles has already mentioned, and see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone. So for those who live in Greater Manchester, we have a WhatsApp group, you know, so you can by all means send us your number and then we will add you. Thank you all. Okay, bye everybody. Thank you. Bye. bye. Thank you, bye, bye. Bye. Bye, thank you. Bye.